So thank you everybody for coming to my talk. Uh, my name is Ed Black. I'm giving a talk on forensics for small to medium sized organizations. Now who am I? I am an institutional defender. What that means is somebody pays me to defend their network uh, and keep their users safe. I've been doing this for 13 years, mostly for small to medium sized businesses. Uh, because of the nature of the small to medium sized businesses, I am the IR guy, I am the threat intelligence guy, I am the forensics guy, I am the threat hunter. And then there's always other things they need me to do. Uh, and a common theme in this talk is in organizations of this size, time is always going to be a factor. There's always going to be something else you need to do, so you've got to try to shoehorn forensics that is going to help the organization into that time frame. So what we're looking at from a forensic standpoint uh, are some keynotes to highlight what the org is going to need out of forensics, what you're going to be able to do for that organization. Uh, the big part of it is understanding what considerations need to be brought into play. What do they need to have forensics done upon? What will not need forensics done? Making sure that you have an environment built to do that forensics based on the needs of the organization. Making sure the organization has an understanding of what forensics is going to mean from a resource and time perspective. And then at the end, we're going to cover some high level, at, the, at a very high level, free tools, and there'll be some references for digging into this a little bit more. And in that situation, we're going to focus on more GUI based tools, things that are free downloads that will be easier for people to get started with. Yes, you have a lot better tools that operate at a command line, but this is a good way to ease in new people to forensics, especially junior team members. So why? Why do a talk on forensics? Specifically at the small to medium sized business level, there's a very simple setup. An alert comes in, something has happened, get it fixed, get it patched, image a box, put it back. From a business standpoint, that's the fastest way to get up and running. Uh, the issue is they don't quite understand how, or how forensics fits into what they need. If you keep getting hit with the same issue over and over and over again, and you have to keep repatching end users' machines because they keep getting the same exploit in a browser, or they keep clicking on the same link in an email, yeah, they can, they can track a metric of, well, you got this machine back up and running in X amount of time. As compared to, well, we know what caused the issue, and if we patch this software, plug this hole, now we're not dealing with that anymore. Now, the other problem we have when it comes to this is as technical people, we get there's a time commitment to doing this. Most of leadership and anybody else in the business watches CSI Cyber or NCIS. Gibbs comes down, Abby, here's this laptop hacking the NSA. Within 45 minutes, she's done it, they have found the bad guy, and everybody's going out for beers. So there have been times I, I have faced, and I'm, I'm sure other people who are in this space have done the same, we think somebody has done something bad. Here is their laptop. We need you to prove to legal by end of the day that was the case. Well, what did you think they did? We have no idea. Somebody reported something suspicious. It did not trigger an alert. You know, be ready to brief Congress. Now, in dealing with this, one question that doesn't come up often enough is, will the organization actually want to take this to court? Now, we think going after a bad guy from a police standpoint, but with small to medium-sized orgs, a lot of the issues that can come up deal with malicious insiders. And maybe it's not criminal, but it's something that could end up in civil court. Now, ultimately, we want to investigate everything as though we're going to sit in front of a jury. The problem is, with the time constraints, whether or not they're going to want to take it to court can impact how you do forensics and whether or not certain steps along the lines of chain of custody, you can skip ahead a little bit because you know you're not going to have to defend it. Now, the caveat there, as you will learn in time, sometimes you and sometimes your organization doesn't get a vote. If you're dealing with a malicious insider or some criminal who has done something publicly, or if the FBI shows up and says, hey, we saw this beaconing coming from your system, we need to examine something, all of a sudden, that could go up there, and your organization may not want it, and you're still sitting in a dock explaining to 12 people and somebody up top of you what happened. Now, 
looking at that question, why would an organization not want to send it to court? I mean, from my standpoint, we have a chance to get the bad guy. In some situations, we can actually identify who that bad guy is. And trying to defend my network, I want to make an example. Whether you're an insider or outsider, if you're going to bring trash at me, I can find you, I can stop you, and I will hang you above the gate so everybody can see we can do that. So from a business standpoint, why not? This is the clue, and as I was discussing at the speaker dinner last night, you probably have to be of a certain age to understand the clue, so just bear with me. This right here is why the company or, or the institution may not want to go to court. Somebody from the audience help me out. There is no way I'm the oldest person in this room. Yes. Okay, very specifically, though. Brand. Thank you. Brand from Goonies. Mr. Cable T. Thanos over here. His character was named Brand. And Brand, as soon as you bring the idea of Brand into any discussion, things start to get a little weird. This is, from an information security standpoint, going public, the great inhibitor. See, when I look at the crown jewels of an institution, I think of things like, all right, my, my domain controllers. What file servers hold company secrets? What systems are the priority systems? What as a service software do I need to worry about? Things that my human resources department might get to, finance might get to. This could go a step farther and be specific physical assets or areas in a given building, or even key personnel. You know, from a, a risk standpoint, if my CEO gets in a car and accidentally drives it off like San, the, the bridge of San Francisco Bay, it's going to hurt a little bit, and there will be a financial impact in the investment markets for my corporation. But if we think about how brand fits into this equation, and how people think about a brand, and how it affects how they feel and would do business with that brand, we start to understand the mindset of leadership. Think about some popular brands. Equifax, Facebook, Comcast, Wells Fargo. I mean, from a brand standpoint, the US Congress is a brand. Now, I don't know about anybody else, I don't get warm fuzzies when any of these names come up. And if you work in the financial services and deal with Wells Fargo, whose security is very shoddy, but if you do business with them, they demand yours is A+. Plus you get especially little, little hackles raised there. Now, for the average defender, when we think about the brand and we catch a bad guy, our brand is strong. We show the world that we can, we can get the bad guy, we can stop them, we can take them down. We are capable of defending our castle. Your efforts are going to require too many resources to try to take what we have. Go someplace else. Now, to the rest of the world, oh my God, they've been breached. We understand basic information security definitions. An intrusion does not equal a breach. Depending on who you talk to or what's reported out in the world, a reconnaissance scan against your perimeter means you have gotten owned. People just don't know better. And we live in a news cycle, cough, Bloomberg, cough, where if a bad report goes out and a bunch of people start talking to it, it doesn't need to be right as long as the voices talking about it are the loudest. So if they put a bad assumption out there, that assumption gets spread, people start to report on it, people start to talk about it, you can't put out that many fires. Then comes along Google and they will carve it into search history forever. So now, you're stuck trying to explain to leadership, well, this was really good, we caught the bad guy. Well, the world thinks we've lost everything and our stock price has just taken a dump. We have accounts that are being pulled, people don't want to do business with us. And we're now faced with the problem that proving we're strong can be a detriment to what we're trying to do for the organization. Now, the last word I'm gonna say about brand if you do something, make a report, or put out any kind of information to show you've defended your brand or made any kind of statement on your brand, 
and it goes badly. This creates the possibility of what we call a career-limiting move. If you tarnish the brand so bad publicly that it becomes repeated in a news cycle or goes down a chute, it then turns into a resume generating event. So understand, this is very important, sometimes more so than what you actually create at a company. You as in the company royal you. That, that the perception trumps the product. If anybody's been to Burger King, they understand this completely. All right, now forensics, I, I enjoy forensics, I like puzzles. I like being able to figure out what the bad guy did so I can put a defense in place that I know is going to work. For those of you who were in the previous talk that was in this room, the idea is there's millions of vulnerabilities out, patch the ones that hurt you, right? If, I'm, if I get a vulnerability because I have one server that has a bunch of lows tied to some product we have uninstalled but there are leftover registry keys, patching those doesn't keep us safe. Forensics will help us identify what happened so I know what defenses to put in place to keep us safe. The biggest part of forensics, especially in a small, small to medium sized org, you need to understand what are you capable of doing? What do your tool sets allow you to do? What do your skill sets allow you to do? So it is the, the old adage spun for forensics. What can you do? What can't you do? What needs to be done and you'll have to get help to have it done? And can you tell the difference between those three things? Now, from an overwhelming forensic viewpoint, what can we apply the discipline of forensics to? Everything. The simple act of existence creates a forensic marker at some level. So we need to look at what do we need to examine, what might we need to examine, what part of that entity has to be examined, how do we do that, and what do we need to do that examination? At a very one-talk, oversimplified level, it breaks down to two things in a digital world. You either have a forensic marker left on a device or something that has been captured traveling over a network. It's either a thing or a communication. From that standpoint, we can gather a lot of information if we understand where in those two buckets we're going to fall. From a device standpoint, a workstation, servers, mobile devices, you know, the, the network gear, will all have something, some forensic instance on its system, in itself, whenever something happens. Whether it's good or whether it's bad, there's always a remainder of somebody connecting, a command being run, a configuration being changed. If I was to break it down into three buckets further, you know, we have the disk, memory, and logs. Now, if you look at how data has been written to this device, how things run on the device, how the system tracks what has happened on the device, those principles will all fall into one of these three buckets. And every one of these can then be mined to be forensically analyzed. Now, in motion, we're on the wire. So that's any of the communications that travels back and forth between your system and another entity, whether that entity is your system, your user, somebody else, uh, what have you. At a very high level, once again, it breaks down into two buckets. You either get the full packet capture, the absolute complete transmission of data between two systems. And then you have NetFlow, which in short order is metadata. It's not what is transferred between systems, it's what were the systems on each end, how much data was transferred, um, what ports were being used, what protocols were being used, and how big of a transmission was it. Now, logs. A lot of people, I have logging in my organization. Sometimes this gets forgotten. If you're not shipping it off to a bucket, a SIM, a log collector at some point, and an adversary is on a device, it doesn't take much for them to flush those logs. Now, when you go back and look and see logs are missing, okay, that's a sign something shouldn't have happened here. But would you rather see that something happened that shouldn't have happened versus here's all the bad things that did happen on a given device or system? And when you ship them off, make sure wherever you're shipping them has some of the strongest permissions in the environment. 
I have seen on more than one occasion, oh, we shipped them off to our SIM. Well, adversary on the box can see, all right, NetStat shows they're all going to this, a whole bunch of traffic to this system. I'm going to go to that system. It's a log aggregator. They didn't lock down the permissions, I can flush the log aggregator. And then even off-site storage isn't going to help. So when doing forensics, there's three places that, in small to medium-sized orgs, you can find the biggest bang for your buck to get forensic information that is going to be of value that will be of use to the institution that you will be allowed to use. And those are the system event logs. What has happened on the system? In what order did that happen? Uh, and what caused A to happen? Did A spawn B? So on and so forth. Uh, who spawned A, who spawned B on that system? Network flow logs, what is, what is everything communicating with? Why, you know, how much data is it sending from point A to point B? Is it using protocols or ports that seem unusual? And then three, browser history. Uh, this is a little bit of bias of mine. I do a lot of work that is more policeman than defender. Uh, compliance will, will want to make sure people are doing things that they're supposed to be doing and not doing things they shouldn't. Um, and the browser history becomes a very easy way to check on that. Anybody who's looked at firewall logs, you have a pretty good idea of what your users are doing, whether or not you want to. Uh, if you actually take a look at the browser history, you'll just pluck your eyes out. So system event logs. And this is basically the what happened by who in what order on a box. Uh, if you work with Windows, you know the magic number, 4688. Uh, this is the command line logs where it tells you what commands were run on a given system. Um, in other systems, Mac, Linux, um, even set up on Cisco devices if you enable it, you can get a running command history that will tell you what ran in what order so you can get an idea of what happened on a given system. So all of these may end up turning, to, turning into your Rosetta Stone because you can look at what happened and then this will allow you to pivot to other systems. I know a command ran remotely at a given time. Well, now I know to look at NetFlow to that box at that time, where did the command come from? Or if I see a script run that was launched by a service, all right, when did that service start? Who started the service? And you can work and build out your timeline of events to help you get back to what started it all so you know ultimately what you need to defend. Now, here's a caveat on these command histories. At its core, 4688 in Windows will log PowerShell EXE ran at this time, the end. Now, that will help because if we see PowerShell ran and then WScript ran or command ran into PowerShell or that spawned from Chrome, it's very helpful to know what's going on. You need to enable full auditing on 4688, also on Cisco devices, Several of the devices require you to do more than just say turn on the logs or log this event. You know, for the full command line auditing, which will then give you, okay, PowerShell ran this specific script, it was encoded, no bypass, no user interaction, base64 string I need to decode. Right? You can look and see this W script ran that, once again, if I decode what the, you know, the trailing part of that, I can see the switches, I can see where it tried to pull something down from the internet. This helps speed up any other pivot points of your detections to try to see, all right, this is what happened and this is what I need to clean up. All right, network flow logs. Uh, as I've said, the, the advantage of starting with metadata versus looking straight at the full packet capture is huge. From a size standpoint, how much information is in the packets versus what is in the net flow is a huge difference. If you're starting to take a look at what happened where and just try to build that communication timeline so you can get further pivot points to investigate to understand forensically what happened in a given event alert intrusion, NetFlow is something you can search through a heck of a lot easier. And the nice thing is the way NetFlow is broken down in a standardized format, it doesn't take much to go in and do a text search on these logs to be able to carve out individual pieces so I can say, all right, I'm just looking for things at a given IP address. All right, from there, I can do another cut to say, all right, what protocols happened? Look at time frames. Something happened at this time and this date. Uh, and from there, you can say, all right, if I can identify this traffic happened at this time between these systems, 
Now, I can either pivot and go look at what happened on the previous system, or if you're collecting your full packet capture, that's the point to go in and say, all right, I know the traffic at this time between these points is what I need to look at. Now we get into browser history. Uh, as I've said, this usually comes up through legal compliance, governance, somebody checking on what the employees are doing. This always gives me a little rash for any Battlestar Galactica fans. Adama's idea of the difference between a soldier and a policeman. I view myself as a defender as more of a soldier. I would love to be able to give compliance access to go be the policeman. Um, from a technical standpoint, I, I get to be the bad guy on both ends. With the browser history, a lot of the tools that will let you look at this will show you, is, if you look at the, the browser history going back, you have, all right, is this something a user clicked on? How did they get to a given page? Is this something that was buried in a bunch of ads loading when they first went to NFL.com? It gives you a chance to look a little bit deeper, see how much of that communication was there. Uh, see, and some of the tools, see upload, see download, see how many times they visited this site. So as I mentioned, with disappearing logs and evidence that is removed, the absence of evidence, by definition, can be the metadata of evidence. We may not know exactly what happened, but we know something happened. Either there's a configuration issue on a system, or somebody is trying to cover their tracks. Now, a couple of examples are one user could have been caught doing something they shouldn't have been doing from an insider standpoint. Maybe they're looking to take private IP and take it to a new employer with them. Well, eventually that user is caught. Now, somebody else who's doing the same thing might realize, hey, I don't want to be caught doing that. All of a sudden, when we investigate that user, Despite working and, and doing business regularly, they haven't used a web browser in a month, according to the, web, the records. They haven't made a phone call on their mobile device in two weeks. They haven't received any text. They haven't used it to look at email. Ultimately, we're not going to know what they're doing, but the idea that somebody who works at my institution isn't using any of their electronic devices throws a flag up. So now we're going to talk about the tooling in a forensic environment. Now, the rule is, in a small, medium-sized business, every dollar counts, and you're fighting just to get the money to have a proper management system in some cases. The money never shows up as needed until something really bad has happened. And when something really bad has happened, they're paying a lot of money to somebody who's not you to come in from the outside with all the really cool tool tools and do the looking. So as you look at what tools you're going to be able to put to use, to help build out these root cause analyses so that you can better defend your institution, we're probably going to look at free. Because we're fortunate that as far as free tooling goes, in the defense forensics and incident response space, we have some of the best tools written by some of the more dedicated people who keep them updated. But when doing any of these investigations with the idea that there is an adversary potentially inside, we can talk about the secret weapon, and that is my little notebook. Whenever I'm doing an investigation that could be something I need to rely on later, especially knowing that the, the golden ticket for an adversary is to be on the communication system. So they get in your Slack, your email, you know, they see, hey, there's a, a phone conference being spun up because there's something going on and I need to know if I'm made. Oh look, there's the conference number, there's the dialing. Any communications you set to try to clear out whatever's going on, any emails that have your notes, if you're posting documentation to a wiki or a ticket management system, bad guy can potentially see all of this. Unless he's Tinkersack walking out of your, your server closet with your domain controller, nobody's going to come see that notebook. Right? Ultimately, you're still going to use electronic communications, but it's easier to keep anything sensitive limited to an eyes-only physical medium. Plus, should you ultimately have to go to court in one of those you don't get a vote cases? Now, this may be your first time, a handful of times you're sitting there, because usually it's outside forensic groups that are brought in. But if you're the initial incident responder, you may end up in that box. And it is the, whether it is the defense attorney or the person on the other side of the civil litigation, that attorney's job is to rip you to pieces. Rightly or wrongly, if they can get 12 people to believe, or in a civil case, seven people to believe you've screwed up, 
they win. So one of the goals of that notebook is you only put things related to that investigation in that notebook. So if people start talking about other things that could happen or say, I want full discovery, it's like, it's all right here. All, you know, from that discovery standpoint, legally, everything I've done is in that notebook. And then email communications are usually tagged in a certain way so legal can pull those. You don't want it mixed with other notes where potentially you are not as careful with your language or your shorthand or, or you're referring to something else that happened that they could try to use to discredit you or your organization. Now, as we talk about the free tools digitally, there's a rule. There's the free beer rule versus the free puppies rule. Free beer is great. I pop the cap, I take a drink, it's easy, it's done. Free puppies. Somebody has given me a puppy, this is great. I need to house train it, I need to spend time with it, I need to see it gets its shots. Ultimately, there will be both a time and money commitment involved, even though it's defined as free. Now, with a lot of these tool sets, somebody can put something out there, and they're like, I have done something good, I am done. And because they're not getting paid for it, these things might not get updated. So over time, perhaps you're upgrading from Windows 7 to 10. Do these free tools still work? Their browser version changes. Does it still work? Was a bug or a coding error found in there, and then it just never got updated? Now, when it comes to any of these free tools, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. If you have a forensic investigation that needs to happen or something comes up and you have, I've got this browser tool, I can take a look at it. I can pull down memory for, from an affected system. I have a tool set that will automate my search of a registry or file system, look at the permissions of the events and see what happened. The first time you run that tool should not be when you are running that investigation. You already have your backup against the wall for time. The goal is to steal little moments before this point so you can get comfortable with that tool so that when the time comes, you can get a little bit ahead in the time spent to get that information to the people who are going to be demanding it every five minutes as soon as they tell you something important happened. Now, when we talk about disks, uh, most of my stuff will look at digital tools, but there's always a talk about write blockers. From a forensic standpoint, you want to have that bit-by-bit -bit image. Ultimately, if you can, you don't want to be working from the very specific device that you're investigating. You want to be able to make a copy of it, then take the original device, let legal hold on to it, put it in a shelf, put it in a box. You know, at that point, you are not responsible for it. They get paid the big bucks to do that kind of thing. You can then make copies of the copy you have made, and this is where you can go in and run your memory tools. This is where you run any disk analysis tools. This is where you run anything that could potentially interact with uh, the file system or anything else on that disk because that will let you always go back and say, I have this pristine copy over here. This is what we work from. Any changes that don't line up with that are the result of my tooling. All right, when we look at imagers, anytime I, I see resumes come across our desk whenever we try to hire and people talk about doing forensic imaging or forensic disk work, it's almost exclusively forensic toolkit. Now, that's not a knock for any other vendors, except to say they are really, really expensive. And uh, Access Data offers a free version of the Forensic Toolkit. It is a slightly older version than whatever the latest is. You don't have all the bells and whistles turned on. But it gives you enough to get your fingers underneath and get in and take a look at what you have on that disk. So from a high level, and, OK, the image is a little offset here. Uh, but this is where, in combination with the right blocker, you can make that disk image. Uh, you have the option to go through, take any images that have been made by somebody else already, hook them up and do your investigations in there, uh, get everything mounted, um, make sure that everything's protected properly before you start doing work. Plus, you have the advantage with that to be able to do, in this situation, it's a bit-by-bit -bit analysis, so you can see the actual data written to disk. The other option you can do with this is you can take uh, an image file and mount it like uh, an external drive. Like you bring it up whatever letter, make it your G drive. And then you can examine the file system in there to go and look to see are there actual physical artifacts, malware you might want to reverse engineer if that's in your skill set, or something you might want to pull a hash of and check against virus total, but not actually upload anything to virus total. Now, looking at memory, 
I know there's a workshop on it this morning. Volatility is usually the de facto standard tool that most people talk about. If you want to get juniors involved in the investigation process or slowly step into doing memory work, I recommend Redline, uh, formerly Mandiant Redline. It is a GUI-based tool that is one of the few things FireEye provides for free. And it's something that you can set up on a forensic workstation and then spin up packages to run against other systems to pull memory from live boxes. Once again, with your note notebook, document when you're doing that. So if people look at, hey, I see these events, that was me, this is what I did, this is why it shows up on the disk. It gives you a couple of options. Just give me your, your standard core things that might trip up when I'm, I'm seeing memory, the things I would normally look for. There is the give me everything option. I want to know everything that has happened in memory on this box. There is, I have a bunch of IOCs. I found them maybe doing forensics on one box, maybe the FBI told me, maybe an information sharing uh, center said, hey, we see this going through your industry. And you just want to be able to run those on boxes that are acting weird. You can do all of that and then bring it back into Redline to take a look. Now, if you haven't done memory pulls, especially memory pulls across a network, think of the average memory on a workstation. 8 gigs, 16 gigs if it's a powerful machine. Get into your servers, 32, 64. Uh, some people, 128 or higher, depending on what that server does. If you need to pull that remotely, well, one, it's going to take time to actually generate the memory capture, to turn all of that into a file it can pull off. And then if you're trying to pull it over a network, think of how long 32 gigs is going to take to pull over a wire from A to B with everything else going on on your network. Things are going to bog down quickly. If you can, you want to deploy your a remote workstation as close as possible to the endpoint to do that memory pull. Now, remember, uh, the advantage of Redline here is it will put a visual timeline of what happened in memory. So it's... Okay. A little bit hard to see. I apologize for that. Um, but what we have is uh, a couple of options here I'm going to focus on. One, it lines everything up by timestamp by default. So this is what happened in this order according to what we found in memory. You know, it'll give you like a field, a basic summary of what it is. Like these are these executables of RAN. Um, these are the process IDs tied to them, which you can use to match up with any EDR tool you may have. Um, and more importantly, it'll also show you where did this run. One of the great mantras about common Windows executables is this is something a bad guy is going to try to do. But if I have a malicious svchost.exe, I can't dump it in Windows 32 because the system processes that rely on the regular one will break and I will crash the system. So unless that's my goal, it doesn't do me anything. At the same time, I also know that the service host should be launched by services exe. If I see Chrome launch it, I either have a developer who's being bad, or this is an adversary doing something they shouldn't be doing. I say that because I've had developers who have been bad in a dev-heavy org, so it happens from time to time. And here's just a further breakdown where, with some of the other options, you can look at where, where some of the hooks are, what ports are being called out to. In this case, it takes that hierarchical process view. So, Process A launch process B that might lead into like C, D, and E all on a tree. And it lines them up for you, once again, in that timestamp order, but it also lets you track your process IDs. So I can see, all right, this is how things ran down in the system. And it makes it easy to go back and say, all right, I know I have this bad executable, and it was pulled down from a script that was launched by Chrome. All right, based on that Chrome process ID, I now have a timestamp. And once again, I have pivot points where I can see what else was happening on the box at that time. Where did Chrome reach out to? What was the user potentially doing? Now we get into policeman land. Um, Chrome forensics. The advantage of, of browser forensics tools is these are some of the easiest tools to get started with. They are very point and click. Um, in the case of Hindsight, which is available on GitHub, it is basically OS agnostic. Right. It's a, Python, a series of Python scripts, 
or there are executable options. One if, from a Windows command line, if you want to do command line. One that's GUI based, where it'll pop up a, a local host window on 8080, and you can go in and run through, and you'll see the, the, the GUI in the next couple of slides. From a free as in puppy standpoint, browser forensics tools like this may be the only thing out there that is actually free as in beer. Easy to run, easy to install, easy to get output that's usable out of them. So from this standpoint, where a lot of the history files are for Chrome, it's standard. Unless somebody's doing something unique with their system, it's going to fall into one given set of buckets. So all you need to do is either run it against that box in the standard profile for that user. Or you can export that history file off and then run it on any other box if that's easier. Now the caveat if you're running this live, if a user has Chrome open, that file is locked and this will error out. Like that, that needs to be a closed file that's not being accessed in order to make use of it. And you have a lot of options. Chrome extension names. I have a story about a Chrome extension that it was interesting because from a forensic standpoint, it looks like nothing spawned this magical call out to a bad domain. I have only in my EDR it says Chrome went there. I looked at the Chrome history, nada. User interaction, nothing. I don't have any given user behavior that shows that this should have happened. And what ended up happening, and, and, and the Chrome extension bit was able to help me figure it out. End user opened up their laptop. They did not have it connected to the company wireless yet. They said, all right, um, I'm going to connect. I'm going to log in to what they thought was Gmail. Well, if you're not careful in Chrome, you might not be logging into your Gmail. You could be logging into the Chrome browser, where it will then try to sync everything you have set up on any other Chrome browser into which you are signed. So this user did this, and then there's a, some time passes while this sync is going on, as it's trying to identify what else has this open out there. So while the user is at lunch, this is syncing up with the other browsers. It then installs all these other extensions from her other browsers. One of these was a malicious extension that immediately began calling out to an Eastern European country where we usually don't see traffic. Now, fortunately for us, it was a broken script but I had to go back and take a look through Chrome because how they track the extensions, uh, especially forensically, without looking to see what extensions are installed, they don't show in the browser history as a call out. It wasn't a user doing this, it wasn't a program doing this, it just magically happened and, and there's no history recorded for it. Uh, the other advantages here with the plugins is get your timestamps. Ultimately, when you're doing forensics, you want to make sure you have a unified set of, uh, a unified time zone in which you're documenting when things happen. There's nothing worse than having offices in different areas, and my sim logs everything in UTC. End user in London is still got his laptop that hasn't updated, so it's on San Francisco time. Then I have somebody in Milwaukee who's on a VPN to Atlanta, so now I've got Eastern time, and all this stuff mixes in. Uh, especially with logging to a centralized device, it's usually very easy to tie what happened when based on that unified timestamp. Now the output it can kick out as a SQLite database or it can kick out as Excel. Um, Excel being the forensic cater threat intelligence person's best tool that's out there. I hate it. Uh, now I ran the tool. I said, all right, I want to show you an output of what this looks like. However, from my poor planning standpoint, I ran this on my personal laptop. So you will understand if I decided not to put my browsing history up on screen for everybody. Uh, but the advantage, when you get this output, you get the URLs, you get the refers, so you see how they got from URL A to URL B. Right? You know, there's a difference if somebody went to unhappypuppies.com and then suddenly they're at perfectlysafe.ru versus somebody ran a Google search, and when Google sometimes auto-loads those pages in the background of Chrome, all of a sudden you have 10 pages load in rapid fire that all load their ad pieces in rapid fire so the cache lets the user get there quickly when they click on what they want. And oh look, one of those pages they wouldn't normally care about has been gamed in the SEO algorithms of Google to move malicious adware up just in case somebody 
hasn't turned off that auto loading in the background. You get lots and lots of details when it was run, in some cases, how long a user was on a page. Now, Windows, I focus a lot on Windows because it is everywhere. You know, it is, it is the matrix. You're jacked in whether, whether or not you want. You have to be one of those few who's found a way to disconnect, not to be connected to Windows. Um, there is a gentleman, I believe his name is Nearsofer. He's got his Nearsoft website, nearsoft.net, where he has a lot of utilities, most of which are free, that are all designed to do one or two small things. So instead of having the, I have bought this one forensic solution that does everything, what specific forensic thing are you doing? He may have it on his site. Uh, this is another one of those, once again, it's browser-based, so free as in beer. Um, it's not as detailed as hindsight, but the advantage that this gives you, it basically hooks into any browser you would expect to see on a device in a corporate environment. Unless we're talking about a, a red teamer, pen tester, or, or whatnot, where they have some weird old version of like Firefox that's been adapted to do a specific thing, this could hook into most of it, and this will get you the history. Now here, it's your standard Windows file viewer output. Breaks it down, breaks it down very basically. It's a URL. What title would you get? When was the visit? How many times has a user gone to this site? and a couple more little bits of material. Once again, it's easy to use. It's an executable. You click, you run. You can also export that, um, the DAT file that carries the history to another device uh, or any of the other history files, depending on browser, and run this offline on a different device. Um, it kicks up in almost no time. Uh, you have the option to also search to try to speed things up. But let's say I work at Wells Fargo, and I'm doing a Wells Fargo investigation. If I don't want to look to see when his browser went to Wells Fargo, I can eliminate any of the internal domains. And then just focus, if, I, if my threat intelligence says this bad stuff is coming from Russia or any, anywhere in the old Eastern Bloc, well, I can just search on given top level domains and only show me that stuff. This way, once again, you, you limit your scope so you have a lot less that you need to dig through. So as we're wrapping up, we'll talk about references. If anybody has taken a SANS class, you were a SANS uh, class in conference, not counting hotel, food, and travel, is the cost of at least a semester at most uh, public universities, if not more, depending on the state. However, they have a lot of good free resources. Um, they have, like any of their posters, if you've ever seen their posters, will give you all the forensic artifacts you need to worry about on a given system. They have them. Windows for memory, network, mobile, I believe they have one for Mac. These are good things to download or just order and have one of these hanging around because they do a good job of breaking down. If you're looking for this, this is where you'll find it. Now, they don't tell you what tool set you need to go to find those, uh, but it will get you most of the way there. Plus, if you want a forensic workstation, they have a really good one, their SIF workstation. Once again, Free isn't puppies, because you download it, but you're going to need to update it, uh, make sure that you have the tools on there you want to use. Um, but once again, free, and it's built to do this. Now, online from a forensic standpoint, uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Phil Moore. What he does that is a huge value in the forensic world is he basically curates articles, tweets, and everything else that's out there and reports on it weekly in This Week in Forensics. And he'll do a monthly rundown at the end of the week, or um, excuse me, the end of the month. So you can get a full listing of what's going on and it's able to keep current without having to try to Google or search. And I believe his site is somewhat searchable. So you can go back and look uh, through history for things that might be relevant to what you're doing. Uh, Brett Shavers has dfear.training, which is another good repository that has resources, educational materials, uh, and a lot of here's what's going on right now in forensics and here's where you may want to look for different things. And then Eric Zimmerman, has a GitHub page where he is developing free tools right now with not quite reckless abandon, but with a great amount of enthusiasm. Uh, and a lot of what he's been doing is getting feedback. So once again, there's a lot you can get from his GitHub page that will help you do forensics. Once again, free as in puppies. Uh, the only caveat to Eric, Eric is a very, very smart man. So he assumes you are a very, very smart person who's using these tools. There's a bit of a learning curve on this. These are the things you want to start out and slowly build up to or, 
or spend extra time playing around with so you understand what you get out of them. All right, so in conclusion, from a small to medium-sized business standpoint, forensics can feel like there's a lot of pressure or what is being asked for by leadership may not be possible. The answer is yes, it is. You just need to make sure you scope your environment for what might need forensics. Make sure you're set to do that forensics and you can preserve evidence in such a way an adversary can't destroy it. Make sure leadership understands expectations that Abby does it in half an hour. Go hire her if you want it in half an hour. Reality is it's going to take longer. I can get certain bits, it will happen over time. And if memory serves, Abby is now unemployed, so if you need somebody, she is available. Uh, practice, 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 practice. Make sure the first time you're using a tool is not the first time you need a tool. And then document everything. Part of documentation is not just protecting yourself if you need to report to somebody else. Part of it is the, we're in defense, we are good people. As I tell my boss, I document things because if I go out at lunch to the falafel truck and the guy with the hot dog cart doesn't like it and wax me because I'm not buying a hot dog, somebody else can come into my documentation and take over the investigation. Even if they have to bring in an outside firm, they can see what I've done and pick up where we've left off. Or if I'm trying to bring up juniors, how do I do this? Take a look, this is how I have done it in the past. Maybe you, maybe you can use this to get to a conclusion you need. Maybe you find a way to make it better, but you don't need to retread, you know, go, or retread any processes I've already done unless it's from a learning or improvement standpoint. So thank you very much for coming. Does anybody have any questions? I was hoping nobody would, but go ahead, please. There. I've, I've heard people talk about this. Um, I've never, I've fortunately never been pinned to the wall about uh, like time skew, but it, it's generally understood and any lawyer who is putting you in the dock to testify that is on your side should be able to back you up on this, right? Nothing is like from a time standpoint, find me two clocks that have the exact same time, right? Even if you have two pulling from the same NTP server, you could be off by a second, right? Or off by some small fraction there's an understanding that there is going to be a little bit of drift, which is where the rest of it comes into play. It's like, okay, we see things ran in a certain order, but based on my process examination, things happen in this order, right? I can use that to build out a, we're aware that there could be this much drift because we also have to account for latency to, is, you know, how long does it take for my box in Chicago to log to my SIM in Detroit versus my box in Tallahassee, right? The advantage of having a log collector is you can use that as your trust but verify on the time sync. Because those log collectors should also be uh, stamping a time this log was received on there. And you can use that to build out your unified timeline to demonstrate, all right, based on this, I can demonstrate latency, I can demonstrate drift. And there is the, in essence, the reasonable range, right? If I'm off by five minutes because I have time servers that aren't behaving or something's not checking in with the time server, well, you've already got a bigger problem than just explaining it to, to the 12 in the box. Um, but as long as you have things set up properly, that limited amount of doesn't line up perfectly from a timestamp is explainable and understandable. And those 12 people, especially with the aid of whoever's on your side of the courtroom, will be able to understand that. And that shouldn't be held against you. You're welcome. Right, I'm hearing... Yeah, maybe one more if anybody's got one. Otherwise, we can all go hit the bathroom and get a drink. Yes, uh, no bathroom breaks anybody. Go ahead. I, I got a really quick story about this. I had mentioned brand and how the company feels about brand. Allegedly, 
because this never happened to any company I've worked for. An adversary was uh, impersonating the brand. OS Int and an investigation gave me the golden ticket magical unicorn this never happens. I found the actual human being, allegedly. I was going to be near the human being at a place where there were going to be lots of federal law enforcement people. Now, in this situation, I would have gone to legal and say, we have a chance to literally crucify this guy, right? I have everything here that no lawyer on planet Earth is going to say it wasn't him. Let's get him, right? This is, this is the hole-in-one, like on the 18th of the Win the Masters. No, what will people think? He didn't steal from us. He didn't breach us, allegedly. But there was the concern that people could see us and Hacker, and all of a sudden there's a business impact. So this guy's home address is burned into my mind. I will remember it. It'll be carved on my tombstone, allegedly. But the decision was made not to go get him. And in, in a lot of these cases, the only time at any of my employers where I have seen, all right, we're going to go to court, it's because in the case of one employer, the FBI has shown up and said, hi, APT1 has hacked you. We need your boxes. That's the only time I've ever seen it go to court and we weren't the ones to take it there. Thank you very much.